This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Stan Osterman from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technology. And uh, this may be a brand new year and nice, quiet, beautiful, cool Hawaiian day, but it's the start of the red hot legislative session coming up soon. They just, uh, they're kicking things off. We get notices of, uh, you know, meetings coming up and uh, update hearings coming up. So I'm really fortunate today to have snagged a really great guest who's uh, high on the uh, I want to meet with you list. And that's uh, Representative Mark Nakashima from Hilo. And he has uh, got a key position now. He's the vice speaker of the House of the Hawaii State Legislature. So Rep Nakashima, so, th so thankful you could join me today. I know how busy you are. And um, mm -hmm. just wanted to talk about, hey, what's new in energy and, and things, and what's new in the legislature, but so, especially things going on in energy, and particularly things going on in the Big Island, because that's you know your backyard and hopefully soon to be my backyard. All and right. uh, we'll, we'll check on things there, but <clears throat> what's up? Well, you know, I think this, you know, this coming year is uh, looking to be uh, different and exciting in some ways. You know, there have been some minor changes in the legislative lineup in terms of our chair people. A uh, long time uh, energy and environmental protection chair, uh, Chris Lee, has moved to the Judiciary, Judiciary. Committee. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nicole Lowen, who has served as vice chair of the committee for a number of years, uh, succeeds as chair of uh, EEP. And so, you know, I'm looking at not too much of a policy ch change in terms of direction, but, you know, I think, um, you know, new eyes uh, uh, and uh, thinking uh, in the committee. So, you know, hopefully we'll see some uh, good things coming out of uh, environmental protection, energy and environmental protection this coming year. Um, you know, on the Big Island, uh, we are looking at uh, completing the um, fueling station, the hydrogen fueling station at uh, Nelha. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's kind of exciting. And once that's done, um, you know, I guess we're waiting for the deployment of uh, three hydrogen fuel cell buses to the Big Island uh, to start their demonstration projects. I've heard that uh, National Park isn't sure if they're going to take theirs or not, and you know right. how we might redeploy those to uh, Hawaii County or others. But you know, I think you know that uh, will also be a game changer having uh, the first hydrogen fuel cell vehicles uh, on Hawaii Island. So you know that's really exciting to look forward to. That is exciting, and um, it's also exciting. We're going to have um, Rep. Lowen here on, as a guest next month. Okay. And now she's going to break away, her, you know, being a brand new chair of that <laughs> committee and getting over there. But um, she's committed to a show already. And um, yeah, I'm very familiar. In fact, the the bus was delivered. The Helion bus was delivered about um, two days after Christmas. Okay. Um, it got off the ship and cleared the port. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. Cyber guys took it up to Cunia and they're fine tweaking it and just fine tuning it and getting it ready to ship over to the Big Island. I know the stations pretty much been ready to run mm -hmm. and Mitch has just been holding off to make sure the bus is ready and timing. It may actually be a really good thing that Volcano's not sure they want to take the buses or not because those two buses are just ready to rock and roll and um, they could easily get over there and jump in the mix as another pair of Helion buses um, right. depending on how the financing works out. So we'll, Mitch Ewan is also uh, a host on, on the shows here at Think Tech. And I think he'll probably, when those when the decision's made on that, we'll finally find out. But it'd be really good if we could get three hydrogen buses running around Kona on the Big Island. That would be awesome. And um, Mitch's station is a is a game changer for a couple reasons. Um, it has a fueling station for cars or buses, mm -hmm. but it also has two refueling posts and two trailers to right. trail the hydrogen, which were supposed to be for up at the volcano. But if those things are now available, that means that he could actually move hydrogen anywhere on the Big Island mm -hmm. to a station or to, um, to help support the transportation sector. Mm -hmm. And that would be awesome. I also understand that in the plans uh, for Nelha's uh, continued development, um, you know, um, 
there is a vendor that is coming in um, to provide uh, a uh, restaurant, grocery, and filling station. And there is also interest in actually putting a hydrogen fueling pump uh, on a commercial property uh, in in Nelha's boundary. Okay. So you know, I think that's kind of exciting too. Where you know, so all of a sudden you know, we have three, the first station and three buses, and then suddenly, you know, there's a commercial opportunity also kind of almost immediately available. So we're looking forward to you know, seeing how that plays out, and um, I think that you know as this grows and develops, you know, it will uh, really set. Um, Hawaii Island and especially that West Hawaii side kind of ahead of the game mm -hmm. in terms of uh, hydrogen fuel technology. And, and the Big Island is the perfect place for all this because the distances, the mountains, the things that make electric transportation a challenge, the things that hydrogen kind of shines in in that electric transportation mm -hmm. area, the Big Island has all those things where, you know, putting an electric bus on Oahu it could be battery, could be hydrogen. But on the Big Island, it's going to be hydrogen. You know, yes, it's like yes. battery buses and things like that just are not probably not going to hack it because of the mm -hmm. ranges that you mm -hmm. have to cover and things like that. So we're looking forward to the hydrogen uh, really growing up there. Yeah. And <clears throat> what, what kind of things in the legislature, do you see any incentives or anything that, you know, we've been working on a couple of um, proposals over the last few years, things like, trying to make sure that hydrogen fuel cell vehicles are counted as electric vehicles under the law, mm -hmm. so that we don't have to change every law that affects electric vehicles to also say hydrogen vehicles, mm -hmm. things like that. Are there any pieces of legislation you're aware of that are coming through? Um, <clears throat> well, I know that, uh, you know, I think we're going to revisit that uh, issue again, okay. uh, especially uh, since, you know, now for this year for the first time, we actually have hydrogen fuel cell vehicles available in state uh, here on Oahu. And I think that, you know, that in itself is, is, is really exciting that, yeah. you know, that there are, uh, that Toyota has uh, provided the Mirai uh, car mm -hmm. uh, here on the island. And with that, I believe that, you know, we, we definitely need to address um, the hydrogen fuel cell uh, technology that having that platform included, um, you know, in in the state laws to uh, provide some uh, incentives for okay. those owners. All right. Um, the I, I noticed there was an article, and I get it from um, it's from a really small newsletter, but it it talked about Hawaiian Electric doing a lot more on the grid with energy storage. <clears throat> kind of leading the charge in the utility world for energy storage for renewable energies, particularly intermittent renewable energy. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're kind of touting that Hawaii actually has more grid energy storage uh, it, or is scheduled to be shortly to have more energy, uh, grid energy storage than the rest of the United States combined. And I, I found that, to if that's factual, and I, I haven't checked that fact, but that's a, that's a huge thing. But the number they put out there was just over a thousand megawatts, which isn't anywhere near what Hiko is going to need just to get Oahu covered under by 2045 for energy storage. So, from my perspective, that looks like hydrogen to me. That's the sweet spot for hydrogen on the grid. And what do you think the chances are of finally getting the PUC and Hawaiian Electric to start taking hydrogen seriously as energy storage on that scale? I think that you know, it, it's really important um, for, for that to be seriously considered. Um, a number of years ago, as I was um, pushing the hydrogen uh, economy and trying to expand it out, one of the things that we did is we met with several of the uh, power producers that were using the intermittent energy, the solar the wind energy folks, and met with them to discuss the possibility of manufacturing hydrogen during the, during the off uh, peak hours, storing that and using that as their backup uh, to provide energy onto the grid 
when the demand was there. Many of them already had a battery storage, and you know, they, weren't in, they weren't looking at changing that uh, technology that they, they had already invested in. But I think as we move forward, um, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, a good time to start looking at uh, hydrogen manufacturing as a method for that fuel storage now because um, not only is it uh, more transportable than, uh, than the batteries, but I think it will prove to be a cleaner long-term mm -hmm. solution for okay. Hawaii. I agree with you 100%, and I'm looking forward to it, especially on the Big Island. And, you know, one of the things that's, that, that happened this past year um, that I think got everybody's attention, and I'm not sure whether it's in a good way or a bad way, is um, in, in your area, the volcano, uh, pumping out a bunch of lava over in Puna, and that affecting Puna Geothermal. And on the good news side, when people saw how much of the power was gone when that, that uh, Puna Geothermal closed during the eruption, um, it got their attention that that was producing actually a lot more power than most people really anticipated. And number two, <clears throat> the fact that, you know, in Puna, a lot of land was covered, but Puna Geothermal wasn't covered. It was touched, but it wasn't really inundated. And there's been a lot of talk about, is Puna Geothermal going to come back, and when? And, you know, can you kind of enlighten us on, on maybe the discussion in Hilo area and, and the Big Island on geothermal in general? Can we look forward to geothermal as a future energy source, clean, renewable energy source in Hawaii to go along with solar and wind? So I think if we can include geothermal, and, and by the way, for the audience, I'm not just talking geothermal only on the Big Island. There's geothermal on Maui, there's geothermal on Oahu. But geothermal in the state as a potential baseline uh, energy um, firm power that the electric companies need to generate, um, is there a future in Hawaii for that, or, or are we kind of bogged down in a not here, it's not going to happen here, like uh, fortunately or unfortunately for nuclear as well? We don't, I don't ever see nuclear happening in Hawaii, I just don't see it happening. Mm -hmm. But how about geothermal? I mean, you, you kind of lived in that world for a long time. So. Yeah, you know, when uh, Puna, uh, Puna Geothermal closed down, uh, the Hawaii Island lost uh, the source of for 30% of its right. base power. And, you know, up until that point in time, uh, Hawaii Island led the state in terms of renewable energies being used for, for uh, mm -hmm. electricity. As, uh, we th as we speak, you know, I know that Puna Geothermal is looking at uh, how they might reopen. Um, Puna Geothermal, uh, when all of this uh, inundation occurred and you know, they couldn't get to their plant, they continued to keep uh, all of their staff on payroll, on standby, working to make sure that the equipment was was being maintained, that everything that could be worked on was keeping being worked on, and, keeping yeah. it safe. And you know, the latest update that we had is that you know they were looking at reopening. What we understand is that reopening is not going to be a quick quick thing either. It's probably going to be a year process mm -hmm. for that to occur. But once they reopen, um, they will be able to come back into the um, mix and again provide power for Hawaii Island. One of the things that we are looking at is other opportunities to expand geothermal beyond that uh, Puna area where it is into other areas of the island that have been identified as having some potential possibility for geothermal. And as you've said, you know, as we look at various uh, research and surveys, you, you know, there, there have been identified areas on every island except Oahu for, for a geothermal opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so 
I think we need to continue to investigate that, to, to look at that possibility, because you know, it is definitely clean energy, it's definitely renewable. It, um, I think in terms of the environmental um, needs and desires for Hawaii, you know, it's one of the um, best opportunities available to us. Now, there are those de de uh, detractors that mm -hmm. have concerns uh, over the current the operation of the current plant. But I think that if we are able to really go with the um, uh, newest technologies available, that you know, those kinds of concerns mm -hmm. can definitely be mitigated. Okay. Well, we're going to take a quick break here and uh, let some of the other uh, programs here on ThinkTech tell you about themselves, and we'll be back with Rep, Rep Nakashima in about 60 seconds. Aloha, I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at two o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii, and on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're gonna be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Hey, welcome back to Standard Energy Man on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm my lunch hour again. And uh, we're talking to Rep Nakashima from the state legislature. He's the new vice speaker of the house for the state house of representatives. And uh, he's from the Big Island, represents the Big Island. In fact, right in his backyard is um, Puna Geothermal and all the volcanic activity, so he's definitely up to speed on what's been going on over there for the last six months or more. And um, we're talking to him about renewable before we went on break and, and about um, uh, geothermal power. So I'd like to pick up where we left off there and, and just kind of keep pulling that thread a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, where are some of the other places on the Big Island, if you can talk about it, that people are looking at maybe tapping into geothermal? It's well, not all right in Puna, correct? It's not all in Puna. You know, there are there are, there are uh, potential spots uh, closer to Kau, um, you know, on the uh, on the saddle uh, between oh, Mauna okay. Kea and Loa. You know, there's been uh, by PTA by PTA. Okay, they've identified a spot. Um, there's been some mention that uh, Huala Lai over in Kona. Okay. might have a potential and you know these are all um, you know the, the potential has been identified but whether or not there really is uh, a source uh, a sufficient source of energy remains to be seen and that would require uh, some investment and mm. uh, exploratory drilling to make that determination and you know, at this point you know no one has put the, that kind of investment up uh, to, to uh, see whether or not those uh, potential resources would pan out. Yeah, yeah, and right now, just a, an observation, I don't see the state legislature having a big appetite for doling out a lot of money for surveys and things like that and, and trying to do that kind of work. But to bring a big company in, there's gotta be potential for a business proposition for them to, to do something, so we could, potentially get a, a large company in that would front the money to do something like that. Um, but, you know, is Hawaii ready for that? Is Hawaii ready for a, a large scale geothermal and having a big company come in and, and take over the, the money part of it? And I think a lot of it would depend on the location selected and, um, you know, whether or not uh, there were a lot of uh, population in okay. those in the area being being looked at. You know, right now um, with Pune Geothermal, it is in the 
in kind of in the middle of a very populated area, or at least up until the lava flow. He was a fairly populated area, and you know, unfortunately, a lot of <coughs> a lot of the um, folks that have been complaining the loudest came to the area after the plant was already there. Um, so you know, I think we'd have to look at uh, also you know. Uh, Land, uh, land use planning in the mm -hmm. area, you know, if, if we're going to uh, explore geothermal further uh, to ensure that, you know, we don't have that kind of conflict between neighborhoods and uh, really an industrial zoning mm -hmm. area, right? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that, that I've been made aware of over the years, in fact, I was made aware of it keenly last year when um, Louis Salveri, head of DBED, was at a, a budget hearing and um, he was asked where the stat what the status was of Hawaii's spaceport on the Big Island because the state has applied for a spaceport license or something from the FAA and NASA or whoever and I know that activity would be on the Big Island are you, are you um, familiar with what the spaceport in, entails and things because <coughs> from my perspective if we did go as far as liquid hydrogen on the Big Island, producing it from geothermal, mm -hmm. that would be another customer or another another market for liquid hydrogen is some vertical launch like rockets, small rocket space uh, <coughs> space exploration. Well, <coughs> you know the uh, the spaceport application that the state of Hawaii uh, made was for Kona Airport mm -hmm. and for horizontal taking off. It was it was uh, the horizontal taking off where it would. Uh, take off and land like a airplane, mm -hmm. and then shoot up and shoot up into the uh, space. Okay. So, it, so it was really more of the space tourism okay. type of model that uh, we were pursuing uh, for Kona. Right now, uh, on Hawaii Island, you know, we are uh, also looking at. The possibility of small satellite launches, right. forty using, foot, fifty foot size, you, you, using, using the uh, smaller rockets, uh -huh. and you know that might be uh, another potential. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, it was just recently announced that you know they're they're going to begin the environmental assessment process, which is uh, required by the FFA, uh, FAA. Mm -hmm before they um, issue the license for uh, a spaceport. Yeah. And so, you know, we're on the very uh, Still in the early infancy stages. Yeah. of that, po that yeah. pop proposal. Well, just something to think about as a former aviator and doing a lot of flying out of the state of Hawaii. Hawaii is very unique, and Hawaii Island is specifically more unique in that there's very little FAA traffic that goes anywhere near the southern part of the Big Island other than tourism kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I mean, in terms of jetways that crisscross, there's probably a few places in North America, including Alaska, where you even could launch vertical takeoff rockets. Even Florida is, you know, they're in a saturated area with, with some traffic. But the, the pluses for space launches is being close to the equator. Yes. And South Point on the Big Island is farther south than, than Florida. So we kind of win there. We're in an area where there's very little, uh, in fact, zero. There's zero FAA traffic over South Point on the Big Island. Mm -hmm. I can guarantee you there's no jet routes <laughs> that go over there. There's one jet route that comes close, and it goes between Honolulu and Tahiti. And they only use it a couple days a week. So even that one is, and, even, and that one is still probably 100 miles away from South Point on the Big mm -hmm. Island. So... There's a lot of great geographical advantages for space operations in Hawaii that are found nowhere else in the United States. And that would be a, a great thing to, I think, focus on to help our economy, not just from the tourism side, but from the overall high-tech job side, um, space exploration side, and uh, the commercial satellite industry side. I think it'd be terrific if we can do something like that. Oh, you know, the, the one exception, I think, to that is uh, we do get a lot of helicopter traffic. Yeah, low uh, altitude from, from, from the tourism. From, from tourism. And I think that, you know, a benefit to the uh, residents of having the rocket launching uh, in your area is that 
you know, there's there's a zone that has to be kept yep. clear of any traffic uh, during a period of time, right. and you know that may lend relief to a lot of these folks that are tired of, tired of the helicopters. <laughs> uh, so you know that that may be a, a trade-off for yeah. them. Well, yeah, and yeah, they put out what they call NOTAMs, notice to airmen, and shut down airspace because we did it in the military all the time, where we had military working areas where. Anybody could technically legally fly through there, but you wouldn't want to fly through there with a bunch of military airplanes flying around. Right. So we would put a notice to airmen, and they would basically tell all the commercial and civil aviation, hey, this area is going to be worked by the military during that time, or NASA. Um, so, yeah, stay out of there. And it, I don't think legally they could stop somebody from flying through there, but you have to be kind of silly to want to fly <laughs> through there during that time. So it, it definitely would help to yeah. tell some of well, the I, Well, this one is... Uh, uh, FAA, so mm -hmm. you know, I think that when when something happens, then yeah, oh, yeah. They, they they do have control of all aircraft, yeah. right? Yeah, if something happened and you got in an accident, it would be your fault, <laughs> definitely your fault, because yeah. you've been warned not to go in there. Yeah. So yeah. So along, we've, we've covered the big on a little bit. We've covered geothermal. You know, the other big piece of equipment that's over on the Big Island that um, is right next to Mitch's hydrogen station, as a matter of fact, is the OTEC. Yes. And um, have you been tracking their technology and <clears throat> where it stands right now? Well, you know, I remember um, as a, as a schoolboy, you know, that's the first time we did OTEC. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, George Ariyoshi was governor back then, mm -hmm. and, you know, they started that first OTEC plant. And it ran for a number of years, and um, you know since then it's been kind of underground, not not really making a lot uh, a lot of uh, noise. However, I know that in the last several years, um, you know, several several companies have been pursuing the old tech technology and seeing if they could make it work. I know we have a uh, working. Uh, prototype plant at uh, Nelha right now. You got kind of a uh, stone throw mm -hmm. away from the hydrogen fueling plant. And I know that you know they are looking at going to the trying to find a way to get to the next level and, okay. and bring a larger plant online. Yeah, because that would be another source of really <laughs> firm base load power for the utilities to use on the grid and yes. help them with their grid stabilization. Yeah, so. and you know every year um, annually th there is a OTEC uh, conference held at Nelha, mm -hmm. um, and I believe it's with uh, uh, Okinawa, where we ha we ha we've had this uh, energy uh, partnership and technology sharing partnership mm -hmm. uh, to kind of discuss and uh, advance that OTEC technology as well as other. Uh, Grid efficiency type of programs. Okay, great. Well, believe it or not, rep, we've kind of blasted through 30 minutes already. All right. It's time to wrap it up. But <laughs> I want to thank you for your support, A, of clean energy in the state, because you've been a champion for your whole time in the legislature and before, mm -hmm. um, and especially your support on hydrogen. I know you've, you're probably the first legislator I talked to when I moved into HCAT, and, uh, and you were trying to beat <laughs> me up over when hydrogen was going to happen. So thanks for your support in hydrogen mm -hmm. and uh, we hope that this year during the legislature you can make a difference and, and get Hawaii cleaned and green and get us off of fossil fuels. So thanks yes, for being definitely. here with us today. All right, and, thank um, you. We'll be watching. We'll be watching for the big island things and what's going on in the legislature with your leadership. So All thanks right. very much. Thank you. Thanks everybody else for joining us today and we'll see you next week on Stand Energy Map. Aloha. <laughs>